Dear members of the SCAR plenary, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the results of the, or the preliminary results of the fourth SCAR foresight exercises. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't be with you because I'm in Montpellier for uh, an FP7 project meeting. Um, as a reminder, uh, I would like to uh, also introduce uh, the, long, the experts working on this uh, foresight report, which are long-term experts, myself, Gianluca Brunori, Michael Carus, Michel Griffon, Louisa Last, and short-term experts that were hired specifically for their expertise, and which, who included Margaret Gill, Tina Kolyonen, uh, Eva Lehoschke, uh, Ingrid Olesen, and Antje Pothast. The purpose of the foresight was to provide food for thought and particularly to provide elements to guide decisions of member states, the commission and policymakers, and especially in the area of research policy. Key questions in the terms of reference were the following. How are the primary sectors affected by and how can they contrib contribute to the implementation of the bioeconomy strategy? How can the bioeconomy improve food security, environmental challenges and other societal challenges? And how should innovation in the bioeconomy be implemented? What are the opportunities, the risks for different sectors, groups and regions? The process that we have been following uh, is, was as follows. We first start by defining the scope of the exercise. We explore challenges and dilemmas to help us in, in limiting the scope in a first stakeholder workshop on, in November 2014. It was an extended workshop, which means that also people outside the SCAR were invited from NGOs, from professional organizations, and so on. In a second workshop, we validated the knowledge base that we assembled. In a third workshop, we analyzed implications of different scenarios and then we derived recommendations. The report in front of you has the following structure. Uh, so after an introduction, it uh, contains a, a chapter on the, transition, on the premises and conditions or the principles underlying a sustainable bioeconomy. It then sets out the state of play in the bioeconomy. It discusses scenarios and then recommendations. One important note is that we uh, use the word biomass to refer to all kinds of outputs of the primary and the secondary sectors, as well as byproducts and waste streams. So we put on the same term many different uh, uh, products and, 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 and elements that may mask underlying differences in values and qualities. So it's not a neutral way of doing that. But please be aware that for simplicity reasons, we uh, kept on uh, using the word biomass. So first, uh, the premises and the preconditions underlying a sustainable bioeconomy. The Commission launched a strategy in 2012 uh, in which it wanted to have a competitive Europe based on a bioeconomy. And this is basically based on two premises. One is that current biomass, forgive me the word, is being underexploited as many byproducts and waste streams are not used in an optimal way. That means that more feed, more materials, more energy, more food can be extracted from current biomass streams. And secondly, that biomass potential can be upgraded by increasing current yields, closing the yield gap, and introducing new or improved species. Now, this concept, as it was proposed by the Commission, of course, it refers to the sectors involved, which is the food sector, the feed sector, the bio-based product sector, bioenergy sector. It includes agriculture, forestry, fishery, food sector, pulp and paper, and so on and so on. But of course, bioeconomy is more than a simple addition of subsectors. It's also a set of relations of actors, of sectors, and of course, also of human societies with the biosphere in general. Why, Bill? Because the bioeconomy implies the provision of goods and services, but also the emission of pollutions and negative externalities, uh, positive externalities like ecosystem services, and it is very important to keep the capacity of that biosphere up to date in order to be uh, functional and viable also for future generations. So that means it's, just, it's more than just an, a statistical concept. Underlying the bioeconomy are some benefits, and these are uh, clear, but also some concerns that reflect different values. Predominantly, there is a positive perception, perception of the bioeconomy among the public. But there are some concerns. For example... Resource overexploitation, especially in developing countries, may uh, endanger global food security. 
There is also within Europe a tension between a focus on high-quality food production and on rural development on the one hand, and the use of cheap biomass as a feedstock for non-food uses on the other. There is also the impact of large-scale exploitation of feedstock, primarily based, for example, in the large harbors of Europe, and the impact that has on, on the primary sectors like agriculture, uh, which may not be organized in a large-scale way. Now, the bioeconomy strategy wanted to address the following societal challenges. One is ensuring food security. Second is managing natural resources sustainably. And that already implies a, a potentially a new region-specific balance between production capacity on the one hand, but ecosystem carrying capacity on the other. It may also, uh, or it will also, uh, uh, imply a better use of waste and the implementation of a circular economy. It implies reducing dependence on non-renewable resources, mainly fossil fuels. It also implies mitigating and adapting to climate change and creating jobs and maintaining competitiveness. In that respect, we also recalculated the importance of the bioeconomy for Europe's economy based on Eurostat figures, and we est estimate that about 19 million people are employed by the uh, bioeconomy, most of them, as you can see, in agriculture, and that they, together they are generating a turnover of about 2 trillion euro. What are key principles for a bioeconomy to be sustainable? Well, we identified four such principles. One is a food-first approach. That is to ensure the primacy of food security. The biofuels uh, hype has taught us that, uh, if we are not careful, that too much use of... Uh, of uh, resources for non-food uses may endanger, in certain conditions, food security. So we need to implement this food-first approach in some way. A second principle is a sustainable yield approach, which is very well known in, for, in fisheries and in forestry, which, where it means that the amount harvested should not be larger than the regrowth of the natural resource. But what does it mean in agriculture? What is the time period over which we should consider such an approach? To what extent, for example, do we need to account also the biomass in the soil to be included in this approach? A third principle is the cascading approach, which means that you use biomass for its highest value first, its second highest value next, and so on and so on. Of course, the question here is what does value mean? Value could be economic value, it can be energetic value, it can mean environmental value, social value, and so on. And a third principle is circularity which means that resources should be reduced, reused, and recycled as much as possible in closing loops uh, in, into a system. Here the big challenge will be how to implement that in a globalized world where these flows are uh, much less under the control of actors uh, than may needed for uh, implementing circularity. With respect to the state of play, you can see here in the table of contents of that chapter that we discussed the current supply and demand of biomass, and now today, based on 2011 figures globally, that we assess the current state of the environment, but then mostly we focus on these three chapters that we have organized according to the end use of biomass, which is food and feed, which is bio-based chemicals and materials, and which is bioenergy. And we ended by looking at the policy framework for the bioeconomy. Because the bioeconomy is a strategy, it's not a policy as such. What we did for these three areas was we identified current trends, dogmas, challenges, uh, technological developments, policy developments, market developments, and so on. Now, it would lead us too far to, uh, uh, ex uh, to discuss this in, in detail. Time also does not allow it. So I would just focus on uh, some of the main issues on this one slide. For the food and feed area, I would say that the main issue there is getting sustainability and getting health right. What I mean with health right, getting health right means, of course, different things for different uh, subsectors of the food and the feed economy. It may mean animal health and plant health and agriculture, but it de definitely means human health in the food sector, where after uh, the increased effort to reduce salt. Now the current uh, focus is on uh, sugar, for example. In the bioenergy sector, what is notable there is the enormous shift that we are witnessing from technologies based on the combustion engine, and so fueled by oil and gas, to technologies based on renewable electricity and, uh, and direct heat. And that 
is actually an enormous shift. It means that the way that we move, it, it, the, the, the way that we produce heat, the way that produce electricity, is fundamentally changing. And thirdly, in the bio-based materials and chemical sectors, we see that commercially, uh, currently, what is, what is happening is, uh, is that uh, these plants, these, these uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, firms, for example, use what we call drop-in strategies mainly. Drop-in strategies means that we use current infrastructure that was designed for, the fossil, uh, uh, for fossil resources. We use them for bio-based resources. So basically, it's the same type of output that comes out of these plants. Whereas new strategies involving new compounds and new products require new investments and new uh, infrastructures and are hence uh, uh, not yet uh, commercially interesting. And that is because many of these new technologies are not yet competitive. And partly uh, that is because of the Renewable Energy Directive that gives prominence to, uh, to using biomass for energy uses, for renewable energy, which increases the cost of biomass for the chemical and the material sector. In other words, between bioenergy and bio-based uh, materials and chemicals, there is no level playing field. Now let's move to the scenarios. We use scenarios in an explorative way, which means that we want to develop robust strategies for the future by identifying uncertainties and their implications and identify success potential. The main idea here is to anticipate multiple possible futures and see to what extent our strategy is robust to these multiple possible futures. So key questions that we presented to our uh, stakeholders in, in, in workshops are the following. Is the current research and innovation uh, agenda robust across of, uh, all these scenarios? Or do, they, do scenarios offer new opportunities or new challenges specific to which scenario? What are their implications for actors, for sectors, regions, ecosystems, and so on? And at what geographical level do these uh, scenarios apply? At global level, EU level, regional level, local level, and so on. Now, the future is not known. It presents us with a set of uncertainties. Of course, it's very important to uh, identify and explore critical uncertainties uh, when we use explorative scenarios. What we identified two, which is the demand growth uh, for biomass for non-food uses on the one hand and the supply growth of biomass in the primary sectors on the other hand. So if you uh, sketch out these two variables in two dimensions and for example you uh, distinguish three levels this would give us nine different scenarios but we only focus on the three or let's say extreme scenarios in, in, this, uh, uh, in these possible worlds which is a world in which uh, in fact, the, the uh, demand growth for biomass uh, materials and energy is low, we call that biomass modesty, and two scenarios in which the demand growth for biomass for non-food use is high, but in one, the supply growth is, is also high, we call that bioboom, and in the other one, uh, actually, uh, high demand growth is not matched by high supply growth, and we call that bioscarcity. How could each of these scenarios be, uh, be, be, become reality? Well, the biomodesty may become a reality because, for example, alternative solutions break through fast. For example, uh, solar technologies are cheap. Uh, they're, they're, they're developed in a much faster way, making bio-based solutions basically not competitive. A bio-boom scenario, on the other hand, uh, may mean that these alternative technologies do not break through, that we still need bio-based technologies, that they are competitive, and that high growth in, in demand will be matched by high growth in supply because, for example, resistance in society towards new technology is limited. In this bioscarcity scenario, where the latter is not changing, uh, it means that high growth in demand is not matched by high growth in supply of biomass, but there is low growth. For example, because there is too much resistance against biotech, against insects, and so on. Or maybe because climate change has negative impacts which in, uh, influence supply uh, to a great extent. What we also did is we, we have underpinned these scenarios with a scoping exercise, a quantitative exercise, in which we simulated, starting from today, based on 2011 figures, uh, what may happen, what could happen in these, of these three scenarios. But as you can see, 
the what we what we did do is in these three scenarios we kept the amount of uh, biomass produced for food and feed purposes constant. In other words, we did the scoping exercise implementing the food first principle, and the, these figures are basically a, pro, a, a projection. These are the amounts that we think, uh, when you take into account less food losses, when you when there is uh, a certain growth in. Uh, 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 in supply and demand, that this is actually the amount that will feed uh, a population of 9 billion, that we need uh, to feed uh, uh, a population of 9 billion in 2050. You can observe the differences between the different scenarios. The biomodesty scenario will allow an increase in both bioenergy and in bio-based chemicals and materials. But of course, the bio-boom scenario will allow much more bio-based and, chem and chemicals and materials to be used, a quadruple uh, of the amount of today. Where in the bioscarcity scenario, this is, of course, much less uh, the case and even uh, will have to decrease if, if a food-first approach is, in fact, uh, successful. What can we conclude from these scenarios? Well, what, what we can conclude is that topics are basically robust. We have not identified new topics to be put on the agenda. But priorities will be different in different scenarios as they represent different challenges and opportunities related to the bioeconomy. Key insight is the importance of governance, of policy coherence. It is key for a successful bioeconomy. And another key insight is that important regional differences apply. It may be that the north of Europe will experience a bioboom scenario, that the world as a whole may experience a biomodesty scenario, and southern Europe may experience a bio bioscarcity scenario. Specific conclusions may be, for example, that in a biomodesty world, the pull effect of the bioeconomy disappears. It means that the urgency to develop bio-based technologies will actually decrease because other pathways exist. In the bioscarcity world, these governance is, uh, governances will be extremely important. Social and political issues much be, will be much higher on the agenda than in these other worlds. Whereas in a bioboom uh, scenario, ecosystem carrying capacity will be much higher on the agenda. Now, what are the recommendations that we filtered out of these different inputs? That is the scenarios, the analysis of uh, the workshop inputs, literature, and so on. And let me remind you that the idea is not to, to uh, formulate a full research agenda, but to provide new insights following the exploration of what the bioeconomy may mean for primary sectors. Another thing I would like to, to emphasize is that the messages of the third foresight exercise are still valid and can be reinforced. We opted to formulate three types of recommendations one on principles underpinning research, one on emerging teams, and one on organizational principles. Let me start with, with the principles that should underlie also the research and innovation agenda related to the bioeconomy. Uh, first of all, you see here repeated the four principles identified before. We need research implementing also these principles. That is food first, sustainable yield, cascading approach, and circularity. But you also see that we added the fifth one, that is diversity. Systems are diverse, they use context-specific practices at different scales, small and large, producing a diversity of outputs. And if we want to maintain that diversity, we, ne we need to make that explicit into a separate principle. With respect to scope of teams, because of the broadening scope of uh, the bioeconomy per definition, it also means that we need to broaden our scope in terms of research, both horizontally, meaning that we also that we simultaneously need to consider all sources of biomass, so also marine and forest resources next to agricultural resources, because they may substitute for each other, or they may create energy by combining them, but also to minimize threats if we use one flow uh, for uh, in, in one sector in, in another sector, but also vertically. It means that we need to integrate upstream and downstream actors and sectors into research addressing primary sectors. In respect to teams, we actually uh, identified eight different teams, and you can see them summarized in this, uh, in this picture, which is ecological intensification, relates to the relationship between uh, primary production and ecosystems, the digital revolution, resilience, especially to climate change, the new energy landscape, 
uh, the new business models that we need to implement the circular economy, the social cultural dimensions of the buyer economy, governance, uh, which is uh, pictured by the box as a whole, and foresight, which is pictured by uh, the development in time. Now let me explore each of these uh, recommendations in more detail. First of all, ecological intensification. That means that we use the regulating functions of nature as a production factor in agriculture, in forestry, in aquaculture. It means using functional ecology as a part of agronomy and animal production. And that can range from input substitution. For example, we use a predator, a natural predator, of a pest instead of the pesticide, to an entire reconceptualization of, of agricultural systems at the landscape level in order to use biodiversity at a large scale. It also means that uh, we need to shift from a focus on monospecies environment interactions to the study of groups of organisms in relation to each other, plants, animals, microorganisms, and also in relation to the environment. In other words, community ecology should be also part of uh, our agronom agronomic uh, approaches. And all of this can be supported by omics and big data approaches, whether you use an agroecological approach or not. A second issue is the digital revolution. It's already in the agenda if we talk about precision agriculture using remote sensing, sensors, and so on. But we also need to investigate and explore the implications of what is called factories of the future, the use of mechatronics, photonics, robotics, 3D printing, and so on. What will that mean for, for agricultural uh, production, for example, and also other uh, uh, primary sectors? It can also mean an enabler for dealing with diversity, because you can use, you can, you can develop technology that actually caters for small scales, for diverse streams of biomasses with different qualities, which is badly needed if we want to keep the, those diverse uh, systems. A third topic is resilience. Resilience is important. Because the hazards, both in terms of immediate shocks as in long-term changes, are there, especially if we are uh, facing climate change. It means increased coordination and integration of different subsectors. It means uh, uh, that we have to map better the effects on animal, plant, and human health, but especially also on uh, adaptation and risk reduction strategies. Can the bioeconomy help in increasing the resilience? What new solutions will it offer? How can even changes in consumption create opportunities for resilience in the bioeconomy? The fourth topic is the new energy landscape, which means what I said before, this shift to renewable electricity and heat generation. What does that mean for agriculture and for input industries? The fifth topic is business models for the bioeconomy. Circularity means that we redesign the way that we uh, uh, relate to each other. It means that actors and activities will be reassembled in time and in space, that we need different production models to coexist, but also work uh, with each other. Small farms need to work together with big processing plants. It also means that we need to involve the public sector, for example, to remunerate public goods in a circular economy, where, for example, the market uh, is not doing that. The sixth issue is, this, is the social cultural dimensions of the bioeconomy. Knowledge is needed about the social impacts of technology and the mechanisms of social change, because they should progress as fast as the technology, otherwise you create uh, all kinds of uh, friction and anxiety. For that, we need to engage all stakeholders, and science may even go as far as radically change food production and consumption patterns. You may have noticed that the Biomass flows going from the consumer outwards did not have a did ha not have a connection, and I think this is one of the big challenges of the bioeconomy is to also include the consumer stage in the circular economy, meaning closing the loops also from urban nutrient cycles. Seventh uh, topic is governance and also the political economy of the bioeconomy, as we said before. A successful bioeconomy will depend on how it is governed, whether policies are coherent or not. And for that, we need to uh, research underpinning that governance and also the political dimensions of uh, implementing a, a good governance framework. And a final element is foresight for the biosphere that should also include more dynamic approaches to avoid lock-in 
uh, when we look at it in the future, because we need to monitor the sustainability, the resilience of the bioeconomy, not only in Europe, but on the biosphere as a whole. Let me conclude by talking about uh, organizational principles. Are we moving from an AKIS system, agricultural knowledge and innovation systems, to BKIS? And in that respect, uh, we were inspired by uh, the notion of mode 2 science as introduced by uh, Gibbons and Novotny and others, and which we think is very much present, for example, in Horizon 2020 and EIP today. So it's very important to make that very implicit, explicit uh, for all actors to, to uh, sensitize them uh, towards this new uh, way of doing science. And that means that science is, uh, uh, that research and innovation is challenge-oriented instead of curiosity-driven. It means that it is transdisciplinary, which means that we need to transcend our pre-existing disciplines and methodologies. It is also socially distributed, which means that knowledge is created in diverse forms, in diverse places, by diverse actors, but we need to make uh, attentions to those uh, who are not included in, in these systems. It means that research should be reflexive, that research is a dialogic process between research actors and objects, rather than an objective investigation where there is distance between the researcher and the real world. It also means that we need new quality standards, transcending the classical peer review, transcending the old taxonomies, but also uh, catering for multiple meanings of quality because multiple actors are involved. And finally, and we added this to this uh, five characteristics of this mode two science is that, of course, researchers, actors, extension officers, policymakers, farmers, uh, foresters, fishermen, they all need the capacities to really make use of this new system, which also play, uh, lays in a very important role for education to also move towards this new uh, way of science. And with that, I would include a summary of our recommendations of the fourth uh, uh, foresight uh, exercise. Thank you.